y'all, this is Quentin with The Road Less Traveled. If you're new here, I wanna welcome you to the channel. I wanna encourage you to hit that subscribe button and think about ringing that notification bell just so you can keep in touch with us, become part of our community. And what we do here at The Road Less Traveled is we are open air evangelists and uh, what some might call street preachers. We go out to the streets and we preach the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ and compel people to come in so that the Lord's house may be full. So just as Jesus didn't come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance, that's what we're doing. We're following in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And right now I'm going into a two, uh, the second part of a three-part series on baptism. And uh, let's get started. Now today we're carrying on with uh, part two of the three-part series, and this is going to be on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So if you remember the first part of the series, if you haven't seen it, I'd encourage you to go back and watch it. But the first part of the series was on the baptism of uh, John, which is the baptism of repentance, the baptism of water. And uh, I'm just going to recap a little bit of that this morning. Uh, but if you will turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, and uh, we're going to read a little bit out of Scripture. Now, here at the Road Less Traveled, uh, we believe in the infallibility of the King James Bible. And we believe that the King James Bible is the perfect, preserved, and inspired Word of God. And uh, we would encourage you to stay away from all those other uh, Bibles, those translations, those perversions, but uh, to stick with the King James Bible, the authorized version. I want to open with a word of prayer, so if you want to pray with me real quick. Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, my brother or sister that's tuned in here with me this morning uh, to study your scriptures. And Heavenly Father, we just we know that we are to study, to show ourselves approved unto you, Lord, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Father, help us as we divide your word, Lord, not to divide it by our own means to eisegete scripture and get it to fit our uh, preconceived notions or our preconceived beliefs, but Lord, laying everything on the table, Father, uh, just coming to you open uh, and, and being led by the Holy Spirit, Lord, we know that he will guide us into all truth. Lord, as we examine your scripture like the Bereans, to examine your scripture daily, Lord, and uh, you will guide us into truth, using scripture to interpret scripture. And Father, I pray that you would set a guard over my mouth, Lord, that as I come with this teaching this morning, Lord, that I wouldn't be given any of my preconceived notions, but just simply using scripture, Lord, to support this teaching this morning on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, which atones for our sin, Lord, that when we come to him in belief, Lord, that you will save us and set us free from sin and death and hell and give us the gift of life Lord and not only that but the gift of the Holy Spirit Father I thank you Father for all that you're done all that you're doing all that you continue to do in Jesus name Amen all right so turn with me here to Mark chapter 1 and we're gonna recap a little bit on the baptism of John the baptism of John Mark chapter 1 starting in verse 4 we read John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins and there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized to him in the river of Jordan confessing their sins and John was clothed with camel's hair and with the girdle of his skin about his loins and he did eat locusts and wild honey and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I, after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately this Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. So right away we see here in verse 4 that John's baptism was a baptism. He was preaching a baptism of repentance 
for the remission of sin. So what is repentance? Repentance is an answer of a good conscience towards God. Repentance is turning away uh, from a life of sin, a life of depravity, and turning to God and uh, tr putting our trust and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 5 there that uh, there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized to him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. So we see that there was something going on there as they came out uh, they were confessing their sins and putting them out there and then they were baptized. Uh, now baptism uh, of repentance wouldn't be just confessing your sins. Confessing your sins uh, with no thought of even turning from sin uh, is, is not repentance. Confession is not repentance and repentance is not confession. Confession is part of the equation of repentance. So the Bible says that you must confess and forsake your sins. It says, let him that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So as we confess our sins, we're to turn from them. Uh, that's repentance. Just as John preached repentance, he was preparing that way. He was preparing the Jews for their Messiah. And we, in the same like manner, we need to repent and we need to commit to God and put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ if we're going to receive what the Lord Jesus has for us. And as I mentioned in the first video there, uh, just a little recap there, that the baptism of John was a baptism of water. John dunked Jesus under the water. How do we know he went completely underwater and it wasn't sprinkling or pouring over of water? Because it says right here in verse 10, and straight away coming up out of the water, uh, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. So therefore Jesus was down in the water and when he came up out of the water, he seen uh, the spirit descending like a dove upon him. Now what's beautiful, I think about this scripture and I touched on a little bit in the last video, I didn't go all into it, but what's beautiful about this passage of scripture is here we see two things. We see two baptisms, the baptism of John, which is the baptism of repentance and water. We also see uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And what's beautiful about this is it's almost simultaneously as John was baptizing Jesus in the water to represent repentance. Now, we know Jesus didn't need to repent of anything. He was living a life without sin. But he did this as an example for us, that we are to repent and turn from sin. And as he was baptized, he come up out of the water. Almost simultaneously, the Heavenly Father baptized the Son with the Holy Ghost. And here we see all three persons of the Godhead, or all three persons of the Trinity, as the, uh, the Son is baptized of the Father with the Holy Ghost, as the Holy Ghost comes down and fills the Son. And then we hear, as there comes a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So they, they bore witness. They seen Jesus. They heard the voice of God the Father. And they seen the Holy Spirit coming down in the form or likeness of a dove. Now, to get a good idea of repentance here, let's turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. We're going to speak a little bit about this repentance, baptism of repentance. Starting in verse 32, Jesus said here, and I quoted this earlier, Jesus said, I came not to call righteous, but sinners to repentance. That was what his ministry was about. Repentance is very important in the scheme of things. I don't believe you can be saved and born again without repentance. If you don't have a repentant heart, uh, then you're not going to be saved. You're not going to stand before God on the day of judgment and be justified. Now, it's not the act or physical work of us repenting that's going to justify us, but it's the blood of Jesus that atones for our sins. But if you can't even repent of the wickedness that was in your life and put your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're not going to receive the things that Jesus has for you. All right, let's turn to Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 46, going through 47 here. And... He was speaking here, Jesus, and he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. 
That's a good mission statement right here. Uh, Jesus himself is telling us what the mission is. Uh, he says that his part was that he should suffer and arise from the dead on the third day. Uh, that proved that Jesus was who he said he was, God in the flesh. And then he goes on to say uh, that repentance which we spoke of earlier, in remission of sins, that is forgiveness of sins, should be preached in His name among all nations. All nations. Here's their call to go unto the Gentiles, uh, not just the Jews, but to go out to the Gentiles. He said to pre preach in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So this is the starting point, Jerusalem. So I've heard it said many times that you, you've heard this repentance preached in the Gospels, but you don't hear it preached by Paul. And I don't know why people would make that claim. I believe they do so ignorantly. Uh, maybe they're not too familiar with the Scriptures, but absolutely Paul spoke on repentance. It was a very important part of his ministry. As we see here in Acts chapter 20, uh, actually beginning at verse 20, it says, How I kept back nothing, this is Paul speaking, He kept back nothing that was profitable unto you but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see basically a recap, Paul's recap in there, what Jesus has said to go unto the Gentiles, but beginning, at the Jew, beginning in Jerusalem. So Paul preached these things not only to the, the Jew, but also to the Gentile, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 10, it says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. I believe that Paul's given us a good description there of True repentance uh, begins with godly sorrow. So a godly sorrow that's working within us uh, works repentance. Now turn with me to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, starting at verse 16. This is actually Peter speaking here. But he's speaking about repentance. I want to see what Peter says about repentance. He said, he that, uh, he says here, that then remembered I the word of the Lord. Now I want to, I'm going to recap on a little bit on this. Remember this, keep this in mind that Peter remembered the word of the Lord. I'm going to recap that later on when we speak about what the Holy Ghost and the baptism of the Holy Ghost is for. It says, Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life? So we see there that repentance is repentance unto life if God grants it to you. Now we know that God is the one that grants us repentance. Uh, we could repent all we wanted. And uh, if, if it's not granted to us of God, then it's not repentance unto life. Now we read in Scripture that Jacob was loved by God and Esau was hated. Now, if you read the accounts of Jacob and Esau, uh, you can see more than likely why God hated Esau. Uh, it's because Esau despised his birthright. He despised it so much he didn't hold it with any kind of value that he would give up his birthright for a bowl of pottage. But the Bible says there that he sought repentance and he sought it with, with many tears, but God didn't grant him repentance. Now, while it doesn't tell us in the Scripture why God did not grant repentance unto Esau, you could easily speculate why. Uh, the man gave up his birthright for a bowl of pottage. He didn't hold his birthright and the blessings of God to any value. And it was only afterwards that he was sorry that he'd done this, that he'd give up 
his birthright when he didn't receive the blessing from Isaac. Now it says that he sought repentance with tears and God didn't give him repentance. And I believe it certainly so is because I don't believe that Esau was repentant with the godly sorrow. Those tears were just a worldly sorrow. It was probably selfishly that uh, he was looking for repentance. It, it wasn't because he had wronged God and held that birthright to no value, but it was because, more than likely, it was because he wanted the blessings, uh, the money, the wealth, the herds that went along with the birthright, the blessing. Now we do see several instances uh, in the scripture of where individuals are filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, now I want to go back to a case in the Old Testament here. Uh, as I was reading this morning uh, through the book of Numbers, it's where I'm at currently in, in my personal time studying the scriptures. I was in Numbers chapter 11 this morning and I was actually going to record this message yesterday and I'm glad I didn't because the Lord showed me something in my readings this morning in Numbers chapter 11 of an example of individuals being filled with the Holy Spirit. Just to recap a little bit here in Numbers chapter 11, we see that the children of Israel are complaining that they're not receiving meat, uh, that they left Egypt, uh, they ate well there, they're not receiving meat that they need for sustenance as they're being led to the promised land. But they're eating of the manna and they're, they don't have any meat. God's been providing for them with the manna, but they're not receiving meat. Numbers chapter 11, starting at verse 11, says, Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them, that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father, beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? Whence have I flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone, because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of thy hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. In his anger, he says here in verse 19, that ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month until it come out of at your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? That's the words, um, that's the word of the Lord towards the children of Israel. And this is what the Lord told Moses to say unto him. And he's told to gather seventy elders. And it says here in verses, starting at verse 24, And Moses went out and told the people the word of the Lord, and gathered to seventy men of the elders of the people, and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud, and spake unto him, and took of the Spirit that was upon him, upon Moses, and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses, and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Now we know that Moses was a prophet, and he was given a measure of the Holy Spirit. And what the Lord did here was he took that measure of the spirit that was up on Moses, and he gave it to the 70 elders. Now I don't know what measure we're given, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. But I know the Bible says that we're filled. So we're full of the Holy Spirit. These men, it doesn't say they were filled, but they were given. Uh, the Spirit rested upon them and they prophesied and they did not cease. 
So they, they were full of zeal when the Spirit of God was put upon them. They began to prophesy. Now what, we know that Moses was a prophet uh, writing the first five books, uh, the Torah, the law. And this is a reason why the Holy Spirit's given unto us uh, to prophesy. Uh, these men, they prophesied. They began to speak the Word of God. And in the time of the Old Testament, that's what they had. They had the Word of God. Uh, they didn't have it written, so they were speaking the Word of God as God gave it to them. And these men were prophesying. Now, prophecy today is, can definitely be different. When we take up the Word of God, we have the written Word of God in our hands. It's finalized. It's complete. We can't add to it or take away from it. So everything that we prophesy will line up with this word, it's completed. We can't add to it or take away from it. When we go out and we proclaim, thus saith the Lord, we're proclaiming what's written in his word because these are the things that the Lord hath said. And we are prophesying when we're speaking the written word of God. And we see this carried out. As Moses said, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. I believe that was a word of prophecy right there that Moses was speaking of the final, the last days when God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh as Joel said. And we'll read that a little bit later here. Turning to the New Testament, we see uh, examples of individuals being filled with the Holy Spirit prior to Pentecost. I want to turn to the book of Luke. If you want to turn with me to Luke chapter 1. So Luke chapter 1 verse 15 says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Now this is speaking of John the Baptist. That he is filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Luke chapter 1 verses 41 It says, it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So she was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she began to prophesy. Now Luke chapter 1, verse 67 says, And his father Zacharias, speaking about John the Baptist, his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Now what we're seeing here, every example of the Holy Ghost filling an individual, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is prophecy linked together with it. Uh, that's the whole purpose of being filled with the Holy Ghost is so they could prophesy. You're not going to prophesy if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. You're not going to have a thus saith the Lord if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. And you could go out on the streets and you could read thus saith the Lord, but it's not going to come with power. It's not going to come with power at all, the power of the Holy Ghost, without being filled with the Holy Ghost. At Luke chapter 7, Verse 28, Jesus is saying here, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Wow, that's powerful. Now we know that Jesus also was a prophet. He spoke the words of the Lord. He was born, born among women, but he wasn't bearing witness of himself. He was bearing witness of John and of all the prophets with the exception of Jesus, all the prophets, there was none greater than he. But Jesus is saying here that he that is least in the kingdom of heaven, he that's born again, he that's baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost and is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's amazing. That tells me that this gift of the Holy Ghost is precious, that it brings great power with being filled with the Holy Ghost. Not power for our own selfish means, but to glorify God. I want to speak a little bit about the promise of the Holy Ghost, as Jesus gives us the promise of the Holy Ghost. And this is right 
here at the end of his Gospels, he speaks about these things, the promise and the coming of the Holy Ghost. But in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus said unto his disciples, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. That was his instructions to the disciples to tarry in Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high, from God the Father. In Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4, it shows us a picture here. It says, Being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. This is Jesus being gathered together with the disciples. They were assembled together. Told them that they shouldn't depart. But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when they therefore would come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples there, of course, letting them know uh, that they will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon them. And then he explains what this power is to be used for. Of course, he links together with the power of the Holy Ghost has come upon him, and they shall be witnesses unto him, both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, this is going to be a bit of a lengthy reading here, but hang in here with me. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 1, we're going to go all the way through 21. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a right, rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speaking in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea, and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? And others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, but it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and all my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now we see there that this was a, indeed the prophecy in Joel being fulfilled. And even as Moses spoke earlier there that he would to God that all of his, the Lord's children would prophesy. This is a carrying out of that. It was a coming to pass of that where the children of the Lord were all prophesying. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now I want to expound upon a few verses here. 
I tried to avoid that as I was reading through it. Uh, first of all, we see there in verse 3 that there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. So like as a fire. It doesn't say that they were cloven tongues of fire. But like as a fire. So they looked like fire. And it set upon each of them. Now I'm going to show you the definition of cloven here. This is according to Webster's Dictionary. Cloven. Participle. Passive of cleave, divided, parted, pronounced cloven. So we see there that cloven tongues, like as a fire, is what appeared unto them. They what appeared unto them were cloven tongues. Uh, now, it looked like a tongue to them. They they seen this. They visualized it. A tongue that was cloven, split, and it looked like a flame to them. But what does this cloven tongue show us? It shows that no longer were they restricted to speaking only their own language, which were Galilean, but they began to speak other languages that these other men, that they hadn't been taught, the languages had been confused. They hadn't been taught this, but the Holy Ghost gave them that other language so that they could be endued with power, so they could be witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, but Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost ends of the earth. If they hadn't had that gift to speak in other languages, they wouldn't be able to uh, go out and fulfill the commission that Jesus had commissioned them with. Now, a lot of people get hung up on the fact that it uses the word tongues here. Uh, they want to think that that's some sort of gibberish uh, tongues, you know, that it's a heavenly language because it doesn't use the word languages. But we clearly see here that what these men were speaking were not a heavenly language. It was a language that was discernible. It was understanding to these men that were from other nations. What do we see here, uh, folks, is a true miracle. Now, we look back to the Old Testament. We know that men in the Babylonian period had built a tower that they were attempting to build all the way to heaven. All these men spoke one language throughout the earth. They were coming together, and with their wicked little hearts, they desired among themselves to reach heaven, to attain heaven on their own, without God. They built this tower and they were reaching up towards the heavens. And we know what happened. God destroyed this tower. And to prevent anything like this from happening again, from men conspiring together again, God confused the languages of the earth. And the true miracle of this day of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit the true miracle that these people were witnessing was that God had unconfused the languages. He'd give a gift to those that were filled with the Holy Ghost to understand, to, well, at that time, they didn't even understand what they were saying. They were just speaking the language fluently. We see that these men were from all over the face of the earth. They were understanding what these men were saying as they were prophesying. That's a miracle, folks. And that's what the true gift of tongues is, the gift of other languages. Today, it's widespread uh, that we uh, can learn languages. There's many people that are fluent in many languages, and you don't even have to be a child of God to speak many languages anymore. But uh, God did unconfuse the languages of the earth uh, so we can still learn if we desire to speak other languages. And it's a gift that's used today amongst missionaries uh, or what well, we call it apostles that go out and plant churches in other countries. A lot of them speak the tongues of other men. And we're going to see here in the book of Acts 2 uh, what Peter spoke as he preached a uh, message that day. And we'll read starting at verses 38 through 42. I'm not going to read everything he, he was preaching, but verses 38 through 42 uh, pertaining to the Holy Ghost. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them, about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine 
and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. There's a, one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture right there. So Peter said there to be baptized in the name of the in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now there's a lot of people that get hung up on that. Should we baptize in the name of Jesus? Uh, or should we baptize in the name of the Holy a Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Well, Peter says here to baptize in the name of Jesus, but if you think back uh, in, in the book of Matthew, Jesus says to go and to baptize all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I want to ask you, where does our authority come from? Does it come from Peter or does it come from Jesus? Now, I'm not saying that Peter was wrong in saying to baptize in the name of Jesus. But the authority comes from Jesus. So if you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, you can't go wrong with that. And verse 41 says they were gladly received His word and were baptized. How, have you gladly received the gospel message and it led you to the point of uh, wanting to be baptized, desiring to be baptized? We see that with Philip and uh, Philip and the eunuch from Ethiopia uh, in the book of Acts there where he was reading out of Isaiah and Philip come running up alongside the carriage and asked him if he understood what he was reading. And he said, how can I unless someone explain it to me? So Philip, give him uh, an explanation of who this was that the prophet Isaiah was speaking about, speaking of Jesus. And he came to believe and he gladly received that message. And he said, what's to stop me from being baptized? He wanted to know if he could be baptized. He found water. He wanted to know if he could be baptized. Now, Jesus commanded us to be uh, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Do we need to be baptized to be saved? A lot say you do. Uh, the man upon the cross, the thief, wasn't baptized. But yet, Jesus said, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, I've heard some from the Church of Christ say, Well, that was under the old covenant because Jesus hadn't yet died and Jesus you know he professed faith in Jesus and uh, didn't need to be baptized at that point but you will remember that Jesus died before the thief died as they were coming to crush the legs of those that hung up on the cross so they would die because the Sabbath was quickly approaching uh, Jesus was already dead but they had to crush the legs of the thieves so that they would die. So the man hadn't yet died, but he professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he did not die before Jesus. So Jesus died. The new covenant came in because of the death of the testator, and he was under the new covenant. But yet his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he was with him in paradise that day. Verse 42 says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. That's a good outline of how we should conduct ourselves in the church, uh, continuing steadfastly, to, just to continue. Steadfastly, you know, to hang on to these truths and continue in them. Uh, the apostles' doctrine, you know, we're to hold on to the apostles' doctrine. There's a lot of doctrine out there these days that are nothing but the philosophies, philosophy of men and the traditions of men, and it's not the doctrine of the apostles. How do you know what the do doctrine of the apostles is? Now, me personally, I've been roped into believing false doctrine before. I fell prey to it many times through different televangelists, uh, through different books and writings from many different authors in the Christian faith. And at one point, I determined not to get roped into this anymore and I stray away from reading any books outside of the Bible. If you want to know what the Apostles' Doctrine was and is, you read the Scriptures and you stick to those fundamentals of the faith, not what some man is teaching, something new or something cutting edge or something that's outside of the Scripture. You stick to the Scripture. And they continued in breaking of bread and in prayer. So break bread together as fellowship together as saints and pray together. Now I want to talk a little bit about what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is for. This is very important. 
There's a lot of confusion on what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is for. I want to show you using scripture, not the traditions of men or philosophy. And some, some out of strange, some strange charismatic book of what the Holy Ghost is for, but out of the book of John and uh, from the words of Jesus himself. John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus said, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Now this is the promise of Jesus of another comforter coming to us. And it's because the apostles uh, that Jesus had appointed and his disciples were walking with Jesus. They, he was their comforter. But there was coming a time when he was going to leave. But he was sending to them another comforter, not just to them only, but to as many as would receive it. Uh, as Peter said there uh, in, in the book of Acts, that this promise is not just for you, but for your children's children, and as many who would receive it. So this promise of the Holy Ghost, it's not just for them, but it's for us as well to be our comforter. Now, what is the importance of a comforter? I seen this the other day and it just blew my mind. <clears throat> uh, we see that the Holy Ghost is a great comforter, friend. He's a great comforter. But in Job, turn with me to Job chapter 16. Job chapter 16. We know that Job was going through more than, I think, next to Jesus, more persecution and tribulation than any man has endured up until this time. Uh, he was going through a lot of horrible plagues and his family members being uh, killed and his famine and just pain and sores upon his body. And uh, he was going through a lot and he was being tr uh, tested. He was being tried. Uh, of course, Satan was bringing these things upon him, but it was by the permission of the Lord because the Lord was trying him and he knew that he would withstand. But Job was looking for comforters. And here in verse 2, uh, Job had said unto them, he said, I've heard many such things. Miserable comforters are ye all. So, these men, friends, supposed friends of Job, they were trying to comfort him, but Job laid it out straight with them. He said, you're all miserable comforters. And we can't say that about the Holy Ghost, man. We're filled with the Holy Ghost. We're filled with the third person in the Godhead, God himself and the Holy Spirit. And uh, we have a great comforter in him. In John chapter 14, we can see another example. And we know that John chapter 14, this is Jesus' prayer for, the, for his children. He said he didn't only pray for the, the church, but also for the world. And here, John chapter 14, verse 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, he's showing them right there that the Comforter is the Holy Ghost, in case they were confused about who the Comforter was he was speaking of. Comforter is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Now we see there that what Jesus says the Holy Ghost will do will teach us all things. We don't have need or necessity that man teach us anything. These philosophies of man are vain deceit. You see a lot of that in the Bible colleges today. Uh, the seminaries or what we call cemeteries. You don't need men to teach you anything. If you're born again and you're filled with the Holy Ghost, if you study His scriptures, the Holy Ghost is the one that authored these scriptures and inspired these scriptures. How better to understand the scriptures than to know the one that authored them? He will teach you all things. He will also bring all things into remembrance whatsoever Jesus said. And that not only applies to us, we have it here what Jesus said. Uh, even when we don't have the scriptures on us, if we commit these scriptures to memory, a lot of times when you're out on the street, the Holy Ghost will bring into remembrance the scriptures that he wants you to say as you're preaching the gospel. 
but it also applied to the to Peter as he said that he remembered uh, what the what Jesus had said. He remembered the words of Jesus that he would baptize with the Holy Ghost. There was a lot of things that Jesus had taught and shared with the disciples that just completely went over their head at the time. But later on, the Holy Ghost brought all these things into remembrance, and then they knew how to apply them in their lives. John chapter 15, starting there at verse 26, Jesus said, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So we see, therefore, also another name for the Holy Ghost, that the Comforter is the Spirit of Truth. This days, this something that's lacking in the world is a Spirit of Truth. People are confused. They believe the lie. We have one sure uh, source of truth: the Word of God, Holy Ghost inspired. He is the Spirit of Truth, and we can trust God with whatever He says. And he testifies of Jesus. He bears witness of Jesus, who Jesus was, who He is, and who He always will be. John chapter 16, starting at verse 7. I'm going to read a little passage here through verse 14. Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. For he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. So a lot to take in right there. But we see not only what the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, will do for us in bringing all things into remembrance, he said a lot of things he was speaking, the, the apostles and disciples, they couldn't bear it. But when the Holy Ghost come, he would teach them, he would guide them. And it's the same with us. If we can't comprehend all the teachings of Christ, we can't begin to bear all the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God. We never will. God, is His ways are so far above our ways. Uh, his wisdom so far above ours. But God shows us these things as we can bear them through the Holy Ghost, uh, revealing these things to us, these truths in Scripture. But we also see what the Holy Ghost does here in the world. He says He reproves the world of sin. So the Holy Ghost is doing a work in the world with the sinners. He's reproving them of their sin uh, because they believe not on Jesus. I want to encourage you to read Romans 1 how they hold the truth in unrighteousness. They don't believe on God. They don't believe on Jesus. But, and that is sin. Sin of unbelief. Uh, of righteousness because Jesus went to the Father and we see Him no more. That He is who He said He was. He ascended to the Father. He's not laying in a tomb like Muhammad, Buddha, Krishna, any of these false prophets. Uh, but he ascended to the Father. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Satan is judged. And he will be judged before us all in the end. So we've talked about what the gift of the Holy Spirit is for us. To empower us to go out and boldly preach and proclaim the gospel. And it's also our source of comfort. All truth brings things to remembrance testifies of Jesus and that's what we do is we go out and we preach uh, the Bible says out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water that's the spirit speaking through us and we're testifying of Jesus and uh, it's not to speak in some 
gibberish. Uh, it's not so we can dance around like chickens and flop around, run through over pews in the church and act the fool. But it's to empower us to go out and witness the gospel. And we also see in John here where Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit to a man named Nicodemus. John chapter 3, starting in verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Now, there's a lot that would say here that uh, this shows that you must be baptized in water to be born again. But we see here uh, that Jesus says, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. They take that to mean that you, you're born of water when you're, you're baptized. And then talks about being born of the Spirit. Now in the very next verse, he actually tells us what that verse, what he was speaking of there. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So we know that when you're born of the flesh, you're born from your mother's womb. The water breaks and you're born of water. And Jesus was born of water. It said he was, he was born of water, but he wasn't born of the blood. He didn't carry the blood of man, the lineage of Adam. But he was born of the Holy Spirit uh, through the Father. And he didn't carry the bloodline of man, but he was born through the womb, uh, through water, and of the Spirit. And he says, likewise, we must be born, uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And he said, marvel not that I say unto thee that you must be born again. You must be born again of the Spirit. See, you're already born of the water, but you must be born again of the Spirit. That spirit that is within you is corrupt. You've corrupted it with your sin. Now, Jesus will cleanse that spirit and for, uh, wash it clean with the blood of Jesus and forgive you of all uh, unrighteousness. And I believe that you can't be saved unless you're baptized with the Holy Ghost. As Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I, I believe that if you're not baptized, if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, then you've not been born again. You're not even filled with the Spirit of God. Uh, so I do take this, John chapter 3, uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. I do believe that is pointing to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I believe it's one and the same. Now, the Charismatics, they will differentiate the two. They'll say you can be born again and uh, be born again of the Spirit but not filled with the Holy Spirit. They speak of the baptism of the Holy Spirit as the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. Well, we, we do see that in one or two places there in Scripture in the book of Acts, but it's not, it's not the rule. You don't always see an individual speaking in tongues when they're filled with the Holy Ghost. And to make that a rule is really adding to Scripture and saying that, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not filled with the, the ghost. You're not filled with the Holy Ghost. And I want to talk to you about what speaking in tongues is. It's not some gibberish. Uh, you know, even the pagans speak gibberish. When it's words that can't be understood by men, uh, it sounds very occultic. That is not the Holy Ghost. It's not, uh, God is not the author of confusion. As a matter of fact, on the day of Pentecost, he took uh, what he had separated the languages of men and divided men because he confused their languages he took and he brought them back together and uh, enabled us to understand a foreign language and that truly points to what speaking in tongues is now Paul spoke about speaking in the tongues of men and angels uh, a lot of charismatics will use that uh, to show that 
there's a difference between the, the tongues of men and the tongues of angels, that angels have this uh, heavenly language that we don't understand and we just uh, rattle it off when we're speaking in tongues. But every instance we see of angels coming to men, uh, these angels spoke in the same language with, that we speak in. They, they were given the gift of tongues as well, the gift of languages, because they could speak to any man of any nation, any tribe in their language. So they were given the gift of tongues or the gift of languages. Now I want to draw a question to your thoughts here about whether the disciples were saved before Pentecost. Some people might think I'm plumb crazy bringing this up, but I do not believe uh, that the disciples were saved prior to Pentecost uh, before being filled with the Holy Ghost. And the reason I say that is because there was an old covenant uh, and a new covenant. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, the old covenant, under the old covenant, the covenant of, the, of Israel, the Jews, this new covenant of Christ, uh, His blood atoning for the sin of all men and uh, putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, being saved and born again, those things didn't come in until the death of the testator. Hebrews chapter 9, starting at verse 14. Uh, says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereon neither the first testament was, de was dedicated without blood. So we see there that the new covenant or the new testament didn't come in until Jesus had died upon the cross and his blood was shed. Then, because of the death of the testator, then came in the New Testament. So, I do believe that the Gospels are a very, very valuable tool to us. And they are the words of Jesus. Uh, but I can't really categorize them as Old Testament because they're not part of the Tanakh. And I can't categorize them New Testament because Jesus had yet not yet been... Uh, he, he was not yet dead and crucified upon the cross until the end of the Gospels. So, uh, but they are indeed Scripture and inspired by the Holy Ghost. But we see there that when Jesus died upon the cross, He brought in the New Testament, the New Covenant. So had these men truly, were they still under the Juda Judaism, the Old Covenant, or were they under the New Covenant? They couldn't have been underneath the New Covenant because the death of the testator hadn't happened yet. Uh, putting their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see a progression uh, with the disciples here. But we do see uh, that they were still under the old covenant uh, while they were walking with Jesus upon this earth. They were still carrying out their Jewish uh, customs. They were still going to temple. They were, uh, perhaps they were still sacrificing. But uh, we see, they, we know they were carrying on with the feasts and uh, they were doing what the Jews were accustomed to do and they were still under the Old Covenant. Now, if you turn with me to Luke chapter 22, I want to show you something here. Jesus' words to Peter, Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, says, these are the words of Jesus here unto Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So pay attention to that word right there. His faith, Satan desired to have Peter and just to, to kill him, just destroy him, uh, to sift him as wheat. But Jesus said he was praying for Peter that his faith would not fail him. So indeed, he was. they were walking in faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it, they were not yet converted as Jesus told him, he said, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So at this time, 
before the death of the testator. They were not yet converted. They were still Jews walking under the old covenant. But they had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is important. Luke chapter 11. Turn with me to Luke chapter 11. Verses 9 through 13, it says, And I say unto you, this is the words of Jesus, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, Will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Friend, have you asked for the Holy Spirit? Have you asked for this gift of the Holy Spirit from the heavenly Father? Jesus said if you ask for it, he will give it unto you. You can be baptized with the Holy Ghost. This is a baptism unto salvation. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost and born again. John was a precursor for the Lord Jesus. He was prophesied that he would come, saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. He was preparing the way of the Lord and making his path straight by preaching repentance, that we must turn from dead works and... Uh, turn to confess and to forsake our sin and put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's preparation for what comes next, the baptism of the Holy Ghost that John spoke about and Jesus spoke about. Have you repented? Have you confessed and forsaken your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Then you can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Have you been baptized? Have you made that a public confession? Not putting away the filthiness of the flesh, as Peter said, but an answer of a good conscience towards God. Have you professed to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and want to make that public? It's symbolic of uh, being lowered into the water and buried with Christ and then being raised back up into eternal life in Him. Have you been baptized? I'm not saying you need to be baptized to be saved, but uh, in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. He did say to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we should want to be baptized like that Ethiopian. Uh, the thief wasn't baptized. And Philip didn't command the Ethiopian to get baptized. He said, what's preventing me from getting baptized? He wanted to be baptized. And we should want to be baptized. Uh, if you've repented of your sin and you've confessed it and you've forsaken it and you desire to serve the Lord, you want to put your faith and trust in Him? Do you desire to be baptized? What's to prevent you from being baptized? Go do it. Go be baptized. And then pray unto the Father to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Ghost, to be filled. And I believe that He will give you the gift that you so desire. I thank you, friend, for tuning in here with me today. I truly appreciate uh, you guys' uh, words of encouragement. and I just enjoy the community of all you brothers and sisters out there. And uh, I miss the fellowship with many while I'm not out on the streets preaching right now uh, as I was in an accident just over a month ago. And uh, I'm down in the back and neck right now. But uh, I'm praying for healing upon my body and that I'll be able to go back out soon and proclaim the gospel uh, out there in the highways and the hedges. But until that time, I want to continue bringing forth some teachings and uh, I thank you guys for your words of encouragement and I uh, pray that this teaching today has been a blessing to you and I pray that if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ oh friend won't you come to him today won't you heed uh, these words that I spoke about of being repentant towards God the Father and placing your faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Once you repent, confess and forsake your sin, and turn and forsake it, and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, fully trust in Him, be baptized with the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Ghost, be born again. 
become one of the children of God. I pray that I may see many of you in the kingdom of heaven one day and we might embrace as brothers and sisters in Christ. God bless you guys. Thanks for taking the road less traveled and we'll see you again next time. Do you drink deeply of Jesus? Will you come to the water of life? You will never thirst again. Let all who are thirsty come to Him. Will you drink deeply of Jesus? Will you come to the water?